Interpol or the police can't find you or whatever. And we're going to go for a couple of seconds of silence now. Welcome to our virtual staff room. And today we're going to do a workspace skill, workspace demo, um, just to give you a flavor of all the additional tools that you get within the workspace environment should you choose to go for one of the paid licenses. I'm going to work through them um, slowly one at a time. I'll do all the teaching and learning additional tools that you get first, and then we'll look at the um, additional bit that you get as your education plus at the end, just as an add-on so you can see the whole thing. And I may even, um, if Dave is still with us, pick his brain about any of the benefits he feels he's had um, with his group of schools um, towards the end, which would be quite nice to hear. So we'll start with the tools here in Google Meet, and I'm going to share my screen. And I'll probably be jumping around, so I'll share my entire screen just for the moment. Close that down. So here we are in Google Meet, and there's a bunch of tools that you get now in Google Meet as part of the teaching and learning license. And the way you access them is in the bottom right hand corner, there's a little logo of a triangle, a square, and a circle. And if I click on that, it shows me the tools that are available to you on the paid licenses. And if I work down, as you, one thing is point out, whilst whiteboard is in there, whiteboard isn't um, one of the paid things. The whiteboard takes you to a Jamboard. Jamboard is on the fundamentals as well, so everyone's got that. Um, but if I start from the top and talk through what we get. So I've gone to my breakout rooms first. Breakout rooms are an enormously useful tool um, if you're still teaching online. And we are finding quite a significant number of our schools and colleges are now building in an online offering as part of their courses that they deliver. It suits a whole range of different people. I'm just going to push the door to because I'm not aware that people are coming in and we might get disturbed. Um, a whole road, a whole lot of kind of people, you know, adult learners returning to education, people with families that might have be only on one course and journey to a college site and back actually adds many more hours onto their day and makes for a much more stressful day. Whereas being able to do it online is much more convenient. And um, if it's recorded, they can do it asynchronously and so on and so forth. So let's just have a look at the, the breakout rooms. This is a great thing. I mean, group work in, a, in education is proven benefits. We know that. So that's great. Here are, I am in mine, breakout rooms, which in effect is my online group work. And it's what, what I've done by clicking on set it up is actually it's automatically created two breakout rooms for me. If I think I need more, I can increase the number here. So I can decide I've got more. I can look at the breakout rooms and decide, well, there's lots of people that aren't here today, but there's a large group in breakout one and only Chris on his own in breakout two. So I'm going to grab Owen and I'm going to move him into the room with Chris. And um, I'm going to stay in the main room because I'm going to be flitting around rooms from room to room, which is very really useful to be able to do. So you can set the dynamics of each of those groups. So you can organize these by differentiation, by group dynamic. You know, if there's some friction within the class, you can move people around so they're not in the same group and so on and so forth. As soon as you've got that sorted, you can decide if you want to set a timer. And that can be for any time that you want. I'm going to select to end the rooms at the set time and it's current set to 30 minutes go okay well that could be 10 15 20 it doesn't matter what the, you can choose the time for yourself and they will automatically close and pull you back and then once you've got all of that ready to go the final step which i won't do during this demonstration because i think you you may have already experienced breakout rooms i would go to open rooms once the rooms are open the students will be in there working away doing their various things if they raise their hand in the breakout room I can see that in this panel here and it tells me which room they're in and I can go and join that room. So I can flip from room to room offering help and support for the various students in the various breakout rooms. One thing to be aware of in Google Meet is that the, from the fifth person onwards, you arrive in a Google Meet automatically muted. So if you've got large groups of five or more in students in a, in a breakout room, when you arrive, you as the teacher, even though you're the teacher, you will be muted. So just be aware of that because it makes for a, a dodgy start um, when you begin the thing. So that's how breakout rooms work, just gives you a flavor. That's the first tool. Second tool, I'm gonna to go to Q&A first. One of the things that I do in lots of my um, sessions now is I open the Q&A right at the very beginning. 
so that if someone if i'm busy doing a presentation like i am now and someone suddenly thinks of a question that question can get posted in there and i can come back to them later but once i've posted a question i can actually organize them i can decide to look at all the questions or just those that are unanswered or just those that i've answered i can even choose to look at the ones that i've hidden for whatever reason i can organize them by oldest or newest first but also by most popular because actually people can vote the questions up so it allows you to generate a kind of a, a sequence of the most popular or the question that's most burning in your students minds and deal with those first it's a great organizational tool if for some reason you don't want the q a open and where you can literally just turn it off there and no one else can ask any questions you won't lose any questions in the list but you you can't add any more and you can always go back to them and also turn it back on again at a later stage and then things will continue as before so those are your q and a's the polls are just literally a poll i'm just going to represent my question with a question mark just for the moment and the options and with a and b just for the sake of, of, of ease today but this you can you're busy working away student ask a question that's a really important question let's just see what the flavor you know what the mood of the room is or a sense check have they understood that concept or a question that prompts them to think about the next topic that you're going to be covering in the lesson it can be any any kind of question at all you can add more options if you want to you can also if you arrive early to your meet you can prepare these in advance so you can have multiple questions so if i just save that one for example that question is ready to go i can then go and create another one i'll call this um question mark one so you can see there's a difference and i'll use c and d so it's apparent what the difference is and then again i can save that one so i've now got two questions pre-prepared that i'll be using in my lesson and i can then when i'm ready to ask the question i can just go launch it's now available for everyone so if you would all vote on that those of you who are in the call so we can see what it looks like as the votes go in you should see it in the same place go to the triangle square circle button at the bottom and that one should be launched whilst you're doing that i want to point out to the people who are watching the video that at the minute they can't see their results but if i chose to i can turn that on and as well as the their vote they will also see what the results of the whole group votes are now so they can see everyone's votes and then when I'm happy, I've got enough responses. I've currently only got two, there are six of us on the call, but we're going to end that poll and then I can then go and launch the next and so on. So it gives you a great deal of control, just a little bit of an early arrival to pre-prepare your polls or to write them whilst the students are doing an activity. So you're ready. So it means that the thing flows very quickly and it's a great way to manage all those questions. You can see that they've got results now in that second poll. And then when I'm ready, I can end the poll. Okay. So those are breakout rooms, Q&A on poll. This session is being recorded um, just for the sake of um, clarity in the three dots at the bottom of the page here, in there, that's where I clicked originally it would have said record, I click record, panel pops up, I'll confirm the record and then um, it carries on recording. One thing that's worth saying about recording is if you've got a one hour um, online lesson with a group of students and there are three or four key sections where you're delivering some significant concept related to your subject in the lesson i would recommend that you record it three times so if you do let, if you take the example you, you, you've delivered information on the key concept the students then go and do an activity to consolidate their learning and understanding about that concept that bit of the recording isn't going to be particularly interesting a group of students with their heads down writing or their cameras off writing doing a task that's not necessarily going to be useful for anyone but if you recorded the key delivery bit then stopped it and turned the recording on again to record the next key concept that you want to deliver and then stop that. You get two nice, neat, short videos. You share those with the students. One, they're much more inclined to watch them. Whereas if you had a whole hour of recording, they probably wouldn't bother to watch it all or they'd get frustrated trying to find the section they wanted to find. So it's a much neater way. So don't worry about having multiple recordings. They're all timestamps so you know which one was which. You would just simply rename them and share them with the students so they've got quick access to the um to the recordings rather than to the whole hour so those are all the tools that you get inside your google meet so you've got all of those to use um should you want to let's then go on to um google classroom It's going to open up a classroom, which is fine. 
I need to get out of there and go back to the home classroom and go to a, an account that's got a license attached to it. Just give me a moment. So we'll use um, Soundtrap as an example. So here I am in my Google Classroom about to create an assignment. I click create an assignment and go close just to get rid of that. Give it a title. OK, and I'm going to assume that you're familiar with all of these bits because I want to go straight back down to the plagiarism check down here. So there's your plagiarism check. OK, it's as simple as that. So what that will mean is that when the student comes to complete the task, they can then choose to run a plagiarism check. And for me, the plagiarism check tool, that's the key differentiator. If you look at other competitors, I won't say their names. Um, what tends to happen with those is that a student will complete their work and they will hand it in and the tutor or the teacher will run a plagiarism check on it. And the student generally doesn't do that. But with this tool, if they do look at some resources on the on the web and try and make them their own, turn them into their own words, they can then run a plagiarism check and see what accuracy link there is to the original. And if they get a 90 plus percent match to the original, then they know that all they've done is changed a couple of verbs. So they need to go back, understand that source a bit better and rewrite it more in their own words rather than just do a simple change of a few words so it gives them a guide about how well they're doing it it will also tell you which ones which sources they've cited and list those but when so the student can go in do their work use all of all the sources that they want as long as they cite them properly it'll list them as properly cited it'll tell them what's going on it'll show them what they need to do to get it further away from a straight copy and paste from an original source so that's really useful and then of course when the teacher does the same they get exactly that same information so they can see the, the source of the quote or information so they know where the student got the information from so it's a, it's a great powerful tool and um, plagiarism checks checks the internet so the data set is huge the other thing that it checks now is it checks a body of work of previous work that's had a plagiarism check applied to it so if your school and college has been running this for a little while um, and you're in the same course and some kind sibling does lent, let their younger sibling borrow their work from the course when they did it two years ago yeah you will see that in in the plagiarism checker when you're on it it'll say yes not only is there a link to this website where they borrowed some text but this great big chunk is actually from this version of this task from this person from two years ago so it not only checks the web it also checks your own corpus of work held internally within the organization which for me is really powerful okay so lots of tools in meet plagiarism check that's the tools that you get in the teaching and learning i just want to then go on to one more tool which is in the education plus tool and that's cloud search cloud search is a full-blown internet search not internet search full-blown google search rather on your account it doesn't break any permissions so if I search for something, if I take Chris, who's on the call with me as an example, Chris has shared many documents. We have had many emails in communication with each other. It does a search for Chris, tells me the contact details of that person at the top, and then gives me a list of all the things that we have shared, including emails, slide decks, chats in groups, sites, sheets, et cetera, et cetera. But I can filter out, I've got tabs across the top that allows me to filter out. So I can just look at the emails that he sent me, I can just look at the documents he sent me, look at any sites that he sent me, any groups that we're in together. Yep, any people that link to it, that's just about, yep. And then a few more as well. You can, I can look at calendar. So any calendar events where we're in together, those will appear. So clearly Chris has got more calendar items than the ones that he and I are in together, yeah, of course. So it doesn't break any permissions. I don't see anything that hasn't got me shared into it directly. And that's the power of it. And it might just be an age thing, but actually I, I find it enormously useful to be able to search for these things because like you, I'm sure you juggle lots of different projects and different themes and different deal with lots of different people. And there are definitely times when you think, oh, well, I'm sure Chris shared that document and it was probably about this thing. 
um, and I can't quite remember when I shared it. Um, and cloud search is now where I go. And cloud search has never yet let me down. That moment, that that senior moment when I can't quite remember what it was or when it was or where it was. Yeah, a few search terms in cloud search, and that finds the thing that I want to find, which has been enormously useful. So I use this a huge amount. Um, it comes with the Education Plus, the, the search. So teacher learning code, all the tools that you saw, Education Plus is all the tools that you saw, plus this last one, which is cloud search. So I'm going to stop sharing. And I did warn um, Dave I was going to do this, and he's a very good friend, so I'm sure he won't mind. Um, and so the question to you, Dave, is uh, any thoughts about um, the impact of that Education Plus license on your organization? Any significant benefits you're already beginning to see? Um, yeah, so for us, I mean, one of the things, excuse me, one of the reasons I was able to justify um, paying the extra was down to the plagiarism checker, because if you look at other plagiarism checkers that are out there that might help you to, I don't know, turn things in, the cost of them is, um, it, it, it's there. It's, it's, it's not, I'm not saying that it's not worth it, but we could we could save that subscription cost by paying for the by paying for the um, the, the extended licenses for google and then we get additional benefits as well one of the key things for our teachers was always going to be the ability to record google meets so that for us is is key the ability for me as an administrator to access some of the the more powerful security tools is really beneficial as well so excuse me sorry i was trying to grab some lunch then whilst we were pre presenting and right. come back to me a little bit quicker than i expected um so i think what you've got to look at is the the grid of benefits that the extended licenses can can offer to you which i'm sure you guys will be able to share a link to but if you're finding items within there that you're not sure whether you'd be able to, to benefit from them then to speak to somebody else who's using them or or you know come back to the to the guys at sea learning you know paul's fantastic at these demonstrations he's been doing these for what feels like years now probably is years actually not, maybe not that many years but but years nonetheless um and, and sometimes it's the it's the art of the possible sometimes we don't know exactly what we need until we see it other times these are solutions looking for a problem and we may not have a problem with it but on the whole it's, it's for me i weighed up the the potential costs versus the potential benefits as we do with all products and and definitely fell down on the side of, of needing to have these solutions in place when i compare it to to license costs for the other side of the um of the of the divide if you like for the for the microsoft license cost it really is a low cost option that really extends the offering that google workspace provides for us brilliant Thanks very much for that, Dave. Actually, and what else you were thinking, there's there one additional tool that I wanted to mention um, that we've already started to use. So I'm just going to jump back onto my share and then share a tab um, just to show people um, this new tool. This is on the Education Plus licenses. So it's the top level license. Um, and it's about approval. So you, here's an example, Doc. Imagine that I've, I've been set a task to write a new policy about acceptable use of the internet for example here's my um here's my policy now fully written and complete once i've done that i can then seek approval from you know my line manager for example so i can just literally go select approvals panel appears on the right i can then decide which person or people i need to seek approval from and it's just about I'll put Ian in there because he's know he's on the call. Okay, I can send them a message. I can allow the approver to edit the file, or I can and then I can lock for the sending the approval request. Yeah, so I can lock it so he can't change it, or I can allow Ian to make changes. But of course, he'd want to do that. I can send him a message. I can also put a date in it, and I'll get reminders saying, you know, Paul's asked you to approve something if the deadline is such and such. Yeah, and then I send the request, and that document then sits. Yeah, it reminds me Ian's not shared with it, so that's fine. So he's got one person allowed to edit. I'm going to go and send. 
just reminder because it wasn't already in there so i don't need to set share separately just need to add it in and it now tells me it gives me this timeline to know that it's there ian will get an email saying you now need to approve this document okay and it just allows us to get that final sign off on documents and you're not going to do it for every document are you but certainly key documents and certainly documents like um you know policies that need reviewing there's ian now on the on the document editing it and making um any necessary changes and once he's happy with the final one he can then approve it and i'll get a notification back saying this document's been approved and then i can then go and publish it and so on and so forth so this could be a really useful tool and um, dave for your governors if they're your governor's user uh, domain okay it's all finished approval's been done it's locked and that's the final version there it is you notice now it's because he's, he's approved it it's locked and that's the final version finished and done so it's a great kind of approval process and make sure that the line manager is fully involved and is aware of the of the process and, and committed to it so and that's in the education plus option i think like like a number of tools that come out there's scope for further development i mean when i first saw that my first thoughts were to look at it from a requisitions perspective <coughs> excuse right. me so that when requisitions are put in and, and sent to the finance team, sometimes we need to get approval from line managers. So I'm interested to see how we can develop that. And also for um, change management, like firewall changes from a technical perspective, just having that um, that process in place where you can edit maybe a line within a document or a, a cell within a spreadsheet, but still get that approval evidenced to show that it's been ticked off and everybody's following the correct change management processes so i'm excited to see how that develops yeah, yeah, yeah as you, it, it, I, sorry go on Ian. yeah it is a very very simple but powerful workflow uh and uh, but within the within the google sort of ecosystem um and one of the questions i was going to ask paul but you um in your screen share <clears throat> you actually showed it was that the document was was locked um sort of waiting approval um so that uh, the, the people couldn't uh, couldn't do it but I, I've, I've seen lots of people over the the years asking for that uh, um, sort of uh, permission uh, to to lock it down and, and as dave said um there's so many processes um that uh, that we go through where uh, just being able to ask for approval uh, would uh, would not only help the process but uh, but it will also provide the evidence so i guess um and Paul, if um, if there was a health and safety document, an update to health and safety, um, and uh, can you um, sort of uh, use those things you know, to actually check whether people have read things, or is that a different uh, feature? Um, well, the approval process checks that the person's approved it, but I don't think it actually checks that they've actually read it. Mm. You know, they could have the document open for an hour and then just click approve and there's no way you would actually know that i don't think there is a tool that actually does check okay in a google doc at this moment in time it's a, it's a, it'd be a really useful additional tool to know they actually have read it even if it just tells you that they've scrolled down yeah so you need to at least scroll the, the majority of the document but yeah david yeah. to say something yeah the best the best way that we have of tracking that is on your google doc you know you the little kind of jagged arrow that shows you the statistics you can see who's interacted with the document that way the downside though at the moment is that individuals have the ability to turn off tracking of their interactions so if anybody's done yeah. that it doesn't paint a true picture no no i agree yeah it can, it has limited use because people can decide not to be seen isn't it that's the thing you don't know the full picture ever mm. But it also leaves room for improvements, Paul. So yeah. uh, you know, we we, we never never want to get to the end of uh, yeah. uh, the the innovation sort of. But it occurred to me that that an approval process in a spreadsheet. If you're talking about requisitions, Dave, if the requisitions goes to finance and they need to supply, you know, a, a purchase order number and a signature and things, requisition um, approval process in a sheet with um cells that have got to be filled in before they can approve it finally might be a really nice little tool because it's currently only in docs yeah that's that, that's what i meant when saying i was excited about how it will develop because as, yeah. as with all these things it starts off as as a seed of an idea and then gradually spreads through throughout the whole workspace ecosystem doesn't it yeah it does absolutely
yeah so there's definitely potential for it and now the, the basic workflows in place it's just about that refining process isn't it yeah absolutely excellent so thank you very much for coming along to the workspace demo today um this will be posted on youtube as always um, and chris will be sharing it out with um, friends and colleagues should they need to see it as well uh, so i'm going to stop the recording for now